It's starting to get really inky out there. Really inky and messy and oh, somebody just spilled their ink bottle. That's gonna leave a stain. Hello Minders, welcome back to The Mind of Watercolor and welcome to Inktober. So it's always an exciting time of year, fall and Halloween coming and pulling out those pen and ink supplies. And so yeah, this year I think I'm going to participate in the full challenge, at least the 31 day part of it. I'm not really following the prompts. I just want to kind of draw and paint what I like to paint. I hope these glasses aren't leaving a glare. I don't usually wear them for my intro, but I had them on and I didn't take them off. Last year I sort of focused on the materials and supplies. I tried a whole bunch of new things, new pens, brushes, all kind of stuff. I just got all those out to try to see what would work well for me or what I liked, what it didn't like. Um, this year I'm going to focus more on technique. I've got some masters. I'm going to kind of share some of the old masters work with you. I like to study those styles and do studies based on something they've done. I also have a review coming up on a book and I'm going to leave that a surprise for now. So the best way to follow me on Inktober is through Instagram or Facebook, my Facebook page. I'll have both of those links below in case you're not following me there and would like to. And of course, if you're just finding out about Inktober and don't know anything about it. My first question is what cave have you been living in? <laughs> but no, more seriously, in case you're just finding out about Inktober, I'll have links down below and you can check that out. If you really don't want to get involved, you just don't feel like pen and ink is your thing or you're just not confident enough, Inktober is a great spectator sport. Just go out there and check what's being done. I mean, it's just the time of year where you're going to see a lot of amazing art. So you can follow the hashtag Inktober 2018, that's for the most current stuff, or just Inktober in general. Just some amazing people out there doing work. Jake Parker himself will be doing uh, Inktober as he always does. La last year he did one piece, one gigantic piece, and each day with the prompts he added a new element to that piece. He's going to be doing that again this year. So you definitely want to check out his work. I'm going to be doing some landscape based things. I'm going to be doing some wildlife based things. I have a bunch of new photos that I took at a zoo near us. Uh, doing some pen and ink work on them would make great studies uh, for future paintings. I will be doing line and wash. So watercolor will enter the picture. I mean, you know better than that. I got to bring watercolor into it, at least for some of Inktober, right? So, as I said, there's lots of ways to be involved in the Inktober, if not in action and deed, at least in spirit. And, you know, just a few suggestions. If you really don't want to draw, get out some pen and ink supplies you've never tried before. Just try them out. Do some value scales or some texture uh, swatches like this. This was with a brush pen, and I was just trying various things with the brush pen. Here's another one where I used my Lamy Extra Fine fountain pen and I was just trying different things. Uh, I also I did some tests with white gel pen versus Copic White. I just got some Copic White which I hadn't had before and I wanted to try that out. Inktober is just about increasing your knowledge and your skill. However you want to do that. The last thing you want to do is enter a challenge with anxiety and pressure and feel like this is what I got to do. If you're anxious about following the prompts you don't need to. This is about improving your skill, your knowledge. Challenges are for you. This is not a contest. This is expanding your horizons. So in that spirit, we're going to get to it. And I have a demo of an elk uh, that I've been doing studies of elk sketches and whatnot. I'm planning on doing a watercolor painting in the future. So I thought, well, I'll do a pen and ink of an elk and it'll both be a pen and ink and you'll get to see that part and I'll be adding wash to it afterwards. Well, Reese here has broken out his uh, October headgear. So I'm wearing the Reese hat. Reese's is my favorite candy, by the way, and he was named after the Reese's candy, in case you haven't heard that story. But anyway, don't you think it's time we started? Yeah, me too. On to the demo. All right, so I'm gonna get started inking with this uh, Fude. This is a Zebra Fude sign pen. That's their SAP extra fine or super fine. And uh, I really came to love this pen last year during Inktober. I did a lot of experimenting with it. It gets really, really 
fine and detailed. Um, it, they actually have three or four weights in this pen, but it gets very detailed and you can still like press uh, like a brush and get a wider stroke. And I'm going to start doing some inking with this and you can see when I press uh, you get a wider stroke and it'll go very fine as well. Not Maybe not as fine as like a, a dip pen or a really fine liner pen, but it will uh, it will do a lot of your good initial lining and so I just really enjoy this pen it's the hard point is less flexible than a real brush it's like a hard plastic point so it gives you a little more control than a real brush and that part I really liked it's actually considered a calligraphy pen it's it's good for like brush lettering but it's permanent waterproof and I'm just starting in with the outlining here uh, using this pen. There was a lot of high contrast shadows on the antlers, so this was a good pen for that. Now I'm not doing it here so much. You should always feel free to turn the work. Inking has to do a lot of with your stroke and your hand position. Um, I've had people ask me about shake and I don't have a good answer for that. You know, how do you deal with it? I have some handshake, but I've found that the way to get a most consistent line and stroke is to pull the pen and or push the pen in the direction that's most comfortable for your hand. And so to do that, you should always feel free to turn the work to make that comfortable and make that easier to happen. I tend to like to pull strokes like you see me doing here on the head with these fine lines. I will sometimes also pull a stroke upwards by tilting the pen towards the top of the page and pulling it up. There's always going to be a stroke for you that's the most comfortable. Usually the least comfortable stroke for me is a side to side stroke or extreme curves or hard especially if you have handshakes. So it's a good idea to turn your work to match your most comfortable hand position and hand movement. Now I'm not going to do a lot of cross hatching in here. I, I use cross hatching in any inking uh, very sparingly because it can look a little distracting, especially in heavier areas. I like uh, to do some cross hatching in the really deep values, but I prefer more uh, using parallel lines or lines that are closely parallel to each other. So they may cross at very extreme angles or only cross slightly. And you say, now what big difference does it make? Well, it allows me to follow the forms, especially in an animal like this that has fur. Direction of your lines is very important. Um, I see a lot of beginners that will hatch or line in their tone, you know, just in a random direction. And you really should pay a lot of attention to texture when there is texture or a consistent direction. So um, for that reason, I will cross hatch only in the darkest values where it almost goes black or very deep. And even then I will usually have a dominant line direction. You know, one direction or one line that can be seen to be stroked in a very definite direction. And I would much rather come back in as I'm doing here again on the head and darken the lines than to go back and cross those lines. Now I'm going to go to this finer Copic multi-liner this is a 0 0.05 and this is just where I need some more subtle shading patterns or you know just little ticks and touches of line. I can also go back in between strokes or along previous strokes and darken them on the deeper side of that value. So I love liners, especially really fine liners for that reason. And there was some subtle shading on the snout of this elk. And I wanted to be able to put that in, but 
the zebra pen was just a little too bold for that so I wanted to do some subtle lining and hatching just to, to portray you know some subtle tone now I'm gonna be coloring this I'm going fairly tight and fairly detailed with this line I'm gonna let the lines and the ink work carry the multitude or the majority of the tone and value and do most of the work and it just becomes you know a coloring exercise with the watercolor and we'll talk more about that when we get to the coloring phase but you can just see me adding very tiny subtle lines and building up some tone gently in areas I loved the light on this elk's face and I wanted to maintain plenty of highlight across the face and on the front of the antlers so it just like any other medium it's it's very easy to get in there and make your values too flat um, making values too flat is an error that happens to a lot of us on a lot of mediums and you can do it in any medium it's just failure to really assess and maybe even at times exaggerate the extent to which values contrast from the deepest values to the lightest so I'm wanting to maintain those highlight values in the face and I can build those tones up gradually and I want a little tone in places because there are some features of the face that I felt are, were important to show form and really uh, that's one of the key important aspects about lining and inking that you need to keep in mind is that it should show form not just value but it should show form and if you're just shading to shade and you're not paying attention to the shape of the form you know his head has shape and volume to it it's round you know or it's rounded so you've got to carefully study those values and see how they accentuate the form this is my brush pen it's a real brush you can see here I'm gonna mess up my finger by showing you it's got real brush bristles uses a cartridge of uh, waterproof ink uh, it will actually get a very very fine line a very hairline but it's hard to control consistently but I like to use the brush pen where I need to go in and start blackening those values now, I could have done that and almost did on the shadow area of the head but I thought you know I want to leave just a little bit of white because I will be coming back with watercolor and color will show through um, those little streaks of white that are left by the pen so I didn't really want to totally blacken in any area now if this had been only a pen and ink I, I probably would have I probably would have added more black I'm back to the Copic multi-liner now and I'm filling in sometimes uh, you just need to even out a tone by adding a line in between a line or making a line bolder you know when you squint down and you see where things little specks of highlight that you don't want or little specks of darkness are that you don't want uh, a real fine liner is a good way to go back in and even things out always keeping in mind the texture and how that texture wraps around the form very important So this is like getting to my final adjustment of the values before I start painting. And I am going with very fine strokes. It's just that they are tending to fill in some of the areas so it looks black and dark. It's just a great pen. I love that pen, that brush pen. That's the Pentel pocket pen. Actually I think this is sort of a fancier version but in essence it's the Pentel pocket pen just tweaking more or less now
And so it's time to start our coloring. This is a new brush. This is a DaVinci Cosmotop Spin Quill. I have some DaVinci Quills, but none of them are Cosmotop Spin, so it's all synthetic quill. Which means it's going to be a little stiffer and a little less thirsty than your average mop or quill. And that's fine because I wanted one that was small and would be good for this kind of task. Um, it has super fine point but has a body enough to hold a lot of water. And um, what that gains me is that I don't have to br I don't have to change brushes very much. And this is all going to be very suggestive in the background. I debated about putting anything back here at all, but I decided, eh, you know, this is practice. This is in my sketchbook. Go for it. Let's see what, what let's see what'll happen. And is is often the case when I do these things uh, with a light colored foreground object, or at least substantially light in many places. I like to put in the background first because it helps me more be more accurate in the values on the foreground object so I know where I am with the background I know what I need to do to the elk's head and I just wanted to hint at a tree line back in the back here um, so a, a dark more distant line behind a more foreground tree line. Again, just suggestive. I want the elk to be the center of attention. I'm using one of my mixed palettes here that's got a mix of M. Graham, Daniel Smith, some of my Mary Blue. And really, a lot of the hard work, as I mentioned, has been done on the values of the elk. So it's just getting the right tones. I still want to model the values with the, with the watercolor a bit. So I'm doing it gradually. Again, being careful not to obliterate those highlights, which are so important in strong light. And I'm going to exaggerate them to an extent. Um, my reference, I'm not showing my reference here, it's its not an image that I necessarily have permission to use, so I don't want to display the image, and I have uh, departed from that image a bit, and this is not a piece I will do prints of or sell, it's just for my sketchbook, so it, could, it constitutes fair use in a copyright sense, but I don't want to exacerbate the problem by showing the image. The other factor in fair use um, is that your work is transformative and it doesn't identify the original work through rote copying. In other words, as long as I'm transformative with this and the original work compared to this could not be identified solely based on my copy. So anyway, just a few ideas there on fair use. The best road to take is uh, if in doubt, don't do it. I've been an illustrator long enough, enough experience with copyright, and my wife is actually a permissions coordinator for a publishing company, so I'm fairly familiar with what I can and can't do. So if you're in doubt, don't. And here I'm adjusting the values of the background to make the facial highlights on the elk pop a little more. The uh, sort of um, sienna browns that are in that were, were not sienna at all. I don't use very many brown pigments. Um, it's actually nickel as of gold and a bit of Quinn rust. And then um, I'll even use some perlene maroon. Um, in some of these deeper values, but those 
colors all mix for very nice browns and I can even add a little bit of green if I want to gray those those browns out and I do all that without using any brown pigments nothing wrong with brown pigments just my preference I find that uh, when I do some very transparent washes that I end up um, getting a lot more luminosity that way than I do with uh, BR pigments. Well, I think we're going to stop there, and I like how that's turned out for a little study of an elk. Had really a lot of fun with the inks. Hope you'll give this a try. Hope you guys are out there enjoying Inktober, watching it, if not participating. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, patrons, for supporting this channel, and we will see everybody in the next video. Bye-bye.